Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It's wonderful to have you all with us. My name's Jamie and I will be taking you through this live lesson on food waste. Um, this follows on from our lesson just earlier today about food chains with developing our understanding of the feeding relationships we might find on the amazing coral reef. I'll be joined later by Pierre Tena as well, and we'll, we'll come to, to that just in a bit. Now, Coral Live over the past years has been all about connecting you to scientists working to deepen our understanding of the coral reef. And to do that, we go to places which we know as field research stations. And we've done that from the Great Barrier Reef to Timor-Leste, Bermuda, and most recently in Curaçao, where we've been working with Karmawi. Now, Karmawi is a fantastic place to do uh, coral life from what we've got. We've got this three pieces of field research station. We've got field, and that's the environment that we're studying really close by, so the coral reef close by. We've got the research element so that you have all the facilities you need to do your research from the dive gear to labs to other equipment to do your science underwater or back uh, in the research facilities and the lab facilities. And we've also got that home from home element. Um, the rooms and the kitchens and the dining areas, all there for scientists visiting from universities across the world to come and study the coral reef more closely. Now, because of obvious reasons, we're in the middle of, or hopefully the middle, or towards the end of the coronavirus pandemic, um, so we are on various stages of lockdown, but very um, kindly the National Marine Aquarium has afforded us the ability to broadcast from here. The National Marine Aquarium is fantastic. It's in Plymouth in the UK. It's operated by the Ocean Conservation Trust. We don't just do this fab public engagement work um, with schools as well, um, but also with projects like seagrass restoration to these amazing underwater meadows coming back. And Pierre, who will be joining us for the Q&A section of this live lesson, is in charge of keeping all the tropical creatures happy and well. So coming into this, we've got some shout outs um, to give, and we also have uh, Let's see where the schools are coming from. And what we're going to do is we're going to find out about how these creatures on the Great Barrier Reef are connected through feeding relationships. So we have schools coming to this lesson from uh, the UK, USA, France, India, and Canada. Uh, just for students uh, watching from France, do remember the next Tuesday, um, and I can't remember the exact time in France. I think it's about 12.30 it's GMT. Um, we do have a French lesson, um, French language lesson then. But we have shout outs to uh, Maya uh, Mayer, who says hello from Brittany in France. Hi, Maya, lovely to have you with us. Um, we've got a good morning from Union Point Academy. Fab to have you with us from Union Point. Um, a big welcome to St. John Henry Newman Secondary School. Um, great to have you with us. And also a good morning to David Leader middle school in Canada. Fantastic to have you and all the other students with us today for this live lesson on food webs. Now, this morning we did some introductory language. Um, so we had a number of different phrases that we used. And that's going to be the first section. And I'm going to go over that. Do drop on, in, on the live chat how much detail I need to go into on that to develop those ideas. Um, then we're going to come into the coral food web activity. And then after that, we've got a chance to answer your questions. Now, earlier, and this is for an upper elementary primary audience, depending on where you're, you're watching from, we went over some phrases um, which were 
uh, predator and prey, those two science words, that pair of science words. And then we also went over consumer and producer. Predator and prey, hopefully you guys have got. So predator, an animal that eats another animal, and prey, an animal that gets eaten by another animal. I'm just going to leave that there. If you need more detail, drop that in the live chat, and that will come up to me here. I should just say on the live chat front, great to those schools who've submitted their questions in advance, but you still can use the live chat, um, which is in this bar um, to the side of the video screen. If you don't have it in full screen, you can always use another device um, if you have it in full screen. So uh, you do need to be logged into YouTube, so have an adult for that, parent, guardian, teacher, uh, parent, guardian, sort of carer at home or teacher at school. Um, the other way that you can send us questions is using the, the, the sort of chat bubble icon, which is in the bottom left uh, of the screen on the Encounter EDU website, and that will connect you uh, to Sim, who is our moderator, and I should mention also Ellie, our producer. So there's three of us on this call, although you can only see uh, me. Uh, I don't know whether Ellie switched over so, so she could give you a wave. You did. Fantastic. Um, so great to have you uh, all with us. That's, that's how you interact. And then let's come into, uh, into the science. The coral reef <clears throat> is a highly, highly connected uh, ecosystem. And there's so much um, various relationships going on. And one of the reasons why it's so highly connected is because the coral reef thrives in sort of ocean deserts and very clear tropical waters. And you might think that clear tropical waters are fantastic. They're great uh, for holidays. They're great for being able to see a lot of marine life. But they're a bit rubbish if you want to find lots of food. Um, so those cloudy waters you might associate with the waters of some of the countries who are joining, sort of, you know, northern sort of USA, Canada, certainly the murky waters often off the UK. That murkiness is often lots and lots of food, and that's made up of plankton. So these are very small um, algae and animals. The algae, plant-like, getting its energy from the sun. We call it phytoplankton, drifting around on the ocean current. Plankton just means drifter. And then we have zooplankton, and those are the tiny animals, eggs, and larvae that float around on the ocean currents um, as well. But in the tropical waters, we don't have that. The coral, with its superpower, getting energy from the sun with algae inside its tissue, we covered on Monday. So do drop in, watch on catch up um, the lesson on Monday. That's on the website and on the YouTube channel as well. But I'm just going to sort of swiftly come into um, the basic idea of a food chain, and then we're going to come on to food web um, in just a bit. So, two terms to think about. We've got consumer and producer. Now, I've got my wonderful from my wonderful coral food chain from earlier. And you can see these arrows coming down. And the arrows are the direction that the energy flows. So really what a food chain does and a food web does is it shows energy flow. And so first of all, at the top of the food chain, pretty much in all food chains on the planet is that we have the sun. And the sun gives energy to producers. So the main producer is the name, science name we give to any living thing that creates energy from the sun. 
And you may have studied the term and the equation for photosynthesis in your science classes at school. But pro producer, that's what, we're, that's what we're referring to when we use that term. And so on the reef, I've identified three. There's, there are more. Um, but I've got um, on the end here, and I'm going to move this closer so you can see that row of producers. So uh, from the left, I think, this is my left, it's always interesting to see as they're into a camera, um, is uh, the algae, the phytoplankton. Then in the middle, uh, we have the seagrass, so that's a type of flowering plant that lives in the ocean. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we have the uh, coral. And just remembering coral, quite complex, um, so it has both sort of the algae inside its tissue that gives it some pretty well in tropical coral reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef, between 70 and 90% of its energy. The other sort of 10 to 30% it gets using its tentacles from copepods floating around in the ocean. Uh, so those are our producers. And then the next stage down, we have what we call our consumers. And then again, from uh, left to right, I have a copepod. It's much uh, smaller than that. It's about the size of your pinky fingernail. Uh, then we have the green turtle. And on the far side, uh, we have the parrotfish. And I think we have photos of uh, some of these animals. So I'm just going to go over them a bit more. I'm going to put this down. Um, so for the copepod, really, really important. It's tiny, but it's the most abundant animal in the ocean. It plays a really important role because it turns algae, this uh, plant-like living thing, into more complex um, chemicals to build bigger creatures. So it plays a super important role. So it eats all the plant, all the algae, and then it gets eaten by bigger creatures and allows for bigger creatures to grow in the ocean. Then we have the green turtle, uh, one of the examples of marine reptiles. Um, there's several different types of reptiles um, in, in the ocean, but the green turtle and other turtles are the ones that, the only ones really I'm, I'm pleased to see. Uh, the other reptiles in the ocean, I'm definitely not pleased to see. I've um, been near crocodiles, uh, saltwater crocodiles, and also sea snakes, uh, which I um, have to say, not a massive fan of. Um, but uh, the green turtle eats uh, seagrass during some phases of its life. At the end, there was the parrotfish, one of my favorite uh, fish uh, on the reef. Um, super, super abundant, um, especially in places like Bermuda, uh, often known as a, the parrotfish capital of the world. Uh, so not just famous for triangles, but for parrotfish too. They have an amazing, um, cool, well, they've got several adaptations, but the one I really love and where they get their name from and this goes back to yesterday's lesson on adaptation. They've got this parrot-shaped beak, which they use to scrape algae off the reef. Uh, very, very cool. Sometimes they get some of the, the reef itself, and when they crush it up with that, that parrot-like um, sort of mouth, it com comes a fine powder. And if you're underwater swimming along, you often see clouds of this fine powder coming out of their bums. And then that poop um, makes up the beautiful tropical beaches um, around, around the coral reef areas. Really, really cool. Two last animals we're going to have a look at. Uh, first of which is the manta ray. The manta ray is what we call a filter feeder. If you can see the shape of its mouth there, you can see that it's not a sort of a mouth really for biting, it's really a mouth for sieving. And it sieves through the water for those uh, small plankton that we talked about earlier, getting its energy from them. 
that's a similar way to some of our larger sharks. So sharks like the basking shark, which you'll find around European shores or in tropical waters, you would have the whale shark, the largest fish on the planet, surprisingly filtering the ocean for these tiny particles. And then perhaps the most iconic predator, apex predator, top predator, as a part of the coral reef system is the shark. I think we've got a photo of a tiger shark up at the moment. Uh, they seem pretty unfussy. There's been so many things found in their stomachs. I think it's from tires to car number plates to all, all sorts of things. But they, they are a fairly voracious predator, not too fussy on the reef. If I look behind me, you won't see um, all of these feeding relationships. We've just got fish in, in, in the tank behind me. But when we think about the coral food chains, it all sort of looks quite simple. You know, it's all nice and divided up um, and it's all, you know, just nice straight lines and everything else. And it's a really useful way to start to understand feeding relationships in an ecosystem and how energy flows. But as we know, nature is much more complicated than that. And so that's why we have the idea of a food web, where we start to develop our ideas. And all a food web is, and all this activity really is, is about thinking how all these food chains can mesh together. Now, I'm going to hold this up quite close to the screen and then I'm going to back away a bit. But I'm just going to hold it up close, hopefully. So you can see just all the lines um, against the aquarium there. I'm going to back up a bit just so we can talk through this. And the whole point of having a food web, and this is the activity for you to, to do in your class or to do at home, I'm not going to go through it step by step in terms of completing it now, but I'm going to go through the idea of it. Now, the whole point of having this um, food chain, a food web, sorry, is you get more of an idea of the complexity. So we've got the same plants and animals um, and other producers um, on here as we had in the food chain diagram, but you can see there's more complexity here. We've still got the sun at the top. And all you do is you start, just somehow my spring has um, hidden from me as I came to sit down, but not to worry, we shall find another one. Here we go. I'll put that down and arrange my spring properly, there we go. So all we're doing with this, so we're starting off with the sun. We're taking our string to a producer, which producer do I have? I have the algae. And then we're going from that producer over to a consumer and trying to create as many connections as possible. So the whole point with this Cut a circle in a piece of card or cardboard, write or put pictures of as many different coral animals as possible. You can either use some of the coral galleries that we have on the Encounter EDU website or do your research yourself and find out how many feeding connections you can find. And the realization here is how connected life is. That these individual species, these different plants, algae, and animals are connected in so many different ways. That also means that if there's any disruption, and I'm going to grab my disruption here, pair of scissors, that if these start to get cut, I'll bring the scissors round to the other side so it's easy for you guys to see. But if you start to cut any of these strings, 
then you start to disrupt this web of life. So one of the ways that life is connected on the coral reef and indeed in environments and ecosystems across the planet is through these feeding relationships. It's complex, but also can be fragile. If you take any of these away, you can see how the whole web of life can start to fall apart. So just to go over the main concepts to learn about a food web. The first thing to understand is key vocabulary, producers and consumers. Producers getting their energy from the sun, consumers eating those or other consumers. The second thing to think about is the relationships and to connect those relationships using string like we have in this diagram. So we've got levels, but we also have connections. And to bear in mind, just as we go into the Q&A stage of this lesson, I would love to see these uh, that you develop at home, that you make in at school, see examples of these. So please do see what the most complex one you could create. Maybe get into a team or a small group and then please do send us a photograph either via email or using social media um, with a teacher doing that um, or an adult. And the hashtag is Coral Live or the handle is at Encounter EDU. So really looking forward to those. But that, that's the sort of the main part of the learning. Those relationships, how they're important but also having be fragile too. I'm just gonna come now to the questions and the step down again. And Pierre's gonna join me and back to our, our marks. Keep our two meters apart. Hello everybody. Um, Pierre, welcome uh, back to Coral Live. Fantastic to have you with us. Uh, for those watching, perhaps just to sort of introduce yourself and your role. Yeah, sure. So my name is Pierre. I'm from France. That's why I have this lovely accent. Uh, and I am a marine biologist. So I work at the NMA as a lead marine biologist. So my department is the tropical department, including that gorgeous tank. And I'm in charge of all the fishes, animals we have. We just make sure they are healthy and happy. Brilliant. Thank you so much. We've got some great questions that have come through. Um, so we've got the first, first one is uh, how we've, we've looked at food chains and connectivity. How does uh, climate change affect that in the ocean? And those are students in Brittany and France. Yeah, right. that's a good question. Um, so basically, climate change affects the food chain because climate change affects every species of the ocean. So as soon as you put pressure on species, the population of these species start to decline. And as the population of these species start to decline, then you don't have enough predators to control all the species of fishes or animals. And then the entire food web becomes disbalanced. It's not balanced anymore. And then you have all that situation happening. That's why it's a threat for the food web. And yeah, just as a follow-up question, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the impact of CO2 on, yes. on the coral reef in particular. How does um, its impact on coral as a habitat forming um, no, animal make it such a sort of crucial you know, part of, 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 of the, the ocean ecosystem, the coral ecosystem. Yeah. So let's try to make it very, very simple, okay? Climate change is happening because of the production of carbon dioxide, okay? This carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean. And the cores are affected by the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the ocean. Right, so if you lose all the cores because of bleaching, because of disease, then you lose all the animals that do live on the reef. 
And then all the predators that do feed on these animals that live on the reach won't have enough food, and then we die. And then step by step, you just lose the entire food chain. Okay, so it's it's a fairly graphic stuff. <laughs> we, 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 we have left that to the end of the week um, to talk about some of the human human impact, human activity on the reef. Um, but it's something that students should be aware of. And um, towards the end of this live lesson, and, and definitely tomorrow, we'll look at some of the things that we can all do to safeguard the reef's future. Um, but come on, there's a question here, and it's from Union Point Academy. Um, asking are there any uh, endangered animals uh, presently um, in Curaçao um, due to a disruption in food chains and webs there? Um, I'm not sure how your Curaçao um, fauna knowledge is, um, but just, just to speak to that, uh, I'm going to talk about two, two, two things. First of which is that sharks have pretty well been overfished. There's where, where we're based, you can see where the shark nets used to be hung to protect swimmers and people uh, uh, near shore from, from these predators. There aren't any shark nets anymore because there aren't any sharks really anymore um, in Curaçao. One of, one of the um, species that people, a couple of species that people talk about rather than just coral, which we've addressed, has a, is under global pressure. Um, one feeding thing where humans part of the marine food web that's being overeaten, um, not just the grazing fish like parrotfish, um, but also conch. Um, conch is a very, um, conch fritters, traditionally a very popular snack um, in the Caribbean, being overfished. And also the Nassau grouper, some of these bigger fish losing both habitat, as uh, Pierre was describing, because the coral reef is, is, is under so much pressure, but also being overfished um, as well. Um, this is from, from Antrim Primary, and it, and it comes back to what we're talking about, about and what we just touched on here. What role do humans have and what impact they have on marine food chains? So they have a huge impact on, like, if you focus on what you were just talking about, overfishing, right? Overfishing, we are more than 8 billion of humans on Earth. We all eat fish or we all consume food from the ocean. If we all consume food from the ocean, then in the next few years, the ocean won't be able to provide enough food for the humans. So by limiting the amount of food you consume from the ocean, then you can fight and you can help the big food web. Uh, but there's also other stuff like um, pollution. Pollution is a big threat. Pollution affects other species, including us as a living organism. Um, coastal development. You know, when you have these big cities and you have more houses, more hotels, more just more and more and more stuff, it becomes an impact for the animals living in the ocean. Just for an example, I know that clownfish, they do breed and they do lay eggs on reefs that are very close to the, uh, the coast. And because of all this construction, hotels, houses, uh, boats, the lights overnight affect them and affect the population of clownfish because the clownfish don't have this dark overnight. It's not dark anymore. It's, it's bright because of the light we have in our cities. So you see there's many different aspects. And, and just, just for those uh, of you, just to reiterate that the clownfish made famous by the film Finding, Finding Nemo, so if you're trying to picture a clown in your mind's eye, that's the one to think about. Um, we've got another question, question here. Um, and perhaps with a reference to some of the behavior we might see behind us. This is again for me in France, a really great question here. How do fish interact? Can they talk to each other? Oh, yes, they can. So, unfortunately, I cannot understand what they say, but they definitely interact, that's for sure. Um, it, it's hard to know how. Basically, I will focus on the movement of the body. So, because they all live together, you can see that sometimes they move the body in a different way. 
And that is basically communication for fishes. But you have way more other channels of communication. But we don't know all of them, that's for sure. Brilliant. Thank you, Pierre. Um, obviously, it's sort of some, some form of communication trying to go on there. Um, we've got a great question here from George, uh, whose dream job is to be a marine biologist. George, I'm going to come to your question just a bit, and I'm just going to ask Pierre what top tips you might give you uh, to land that dream job of yours? Well, so you have the basic tips like go to school, go to university, have, have a degree, that's for sure. You need a degree to, to then be able to work in the field. But I would say that the most important thing is to be, to have the passion. You need to have the passion about ocean, about marine life. If you have this passion, if you are stubborn and you just want to work in that field, do everything you can to work in that field and those will open to you, that's for sure. Are you, have you got an internship open? Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> please, please. Uh, go in touch and I'm not quite sure how old you are, but when you're at the right age, um, yeah. well, you can apply for an internship. Uh, great first step, brilliant. But George's question is, uh, what is your favorite sea creature? My favorite sea creature is a fish. It's called a Moorish idol. The Latin name is Zenclus cornutus. Okay. <laughs> it's a fish we have on display. Uh, I don't currently see it because it's a very large tank, so it might be on the back somewhere. Uh, it's very common on reef in the Indo Pacific region. Uh, the name is Moorish Idol. So Moorish Idol, so the M O O R I S H. Yeah, you got it. And then space I D O L. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that, we'll try and get a link to a photo into the live chat. You can have a look at that. So what, what, what makes it your favorite here? It's gorgeous. It, it's gorgeous. The way it swims in the ocean, it, the, yeah, the way they swim, the, they have like, this stripe white and black, they're gorgeous. They, they're really gorgeous. And they have this long fin on the top of the body. They're really gorgeous fish. Right, perfect for, for me. <laughs> I, this is not a fish. I'm going to go for an invertebrate. And I have a very big soft spot for Christmas tree worms. Yes. Uh, which which look absolutely amazing. We'll try and get links uh, to both those uh, species uh, into the live chat so you can have a, have a look uh, later. Uh, from Andrew Primary. What's the most interesting animal you've come into contact with in the ocean? That's interesting. Yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> the most interesting, uh, I would definitely say the perfect fish. Okay. The perfect fish, so we have a few in that system. Oh. They have, they, I don't know how, but they manage to have interaction with the humans. I wouldn't say they are smarter than other fishes, but you can get into interaction with them. It's impressive. They communicate with you. And one funny thing is that when they're very hungry and they want some food, they come at the surface of the water and they start splashing water on you. Uh, the, the, yeah, they're very interesting fishes. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking to find the octopus. Oh, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. It, it's, um, I, I mean, Ellie, when we were at the Curacao, I think last year or the year before, I got some fabulous footage of, of the octopus, and I'm not sure we can play it today, but we can definitely get it on um, any signaling that we can get it up to you. But its behavior and uh, its, uh, its ability to respond to its environment, change colors, um, escape, change shape, disguise itself as a piece of coral, almost change it, so, you know, this substance of its body. Absolutely fascinating, and I think certainly in there used to be this idea that invertebrates, animals without a backbone, were not as intelligent as animals with a backbone. And certainly, observing an octopus in the ocean completely takes away that idea. Yeah. So we have um, the great question there from Antrim Primary. Um, so George definitely angling for your job here. Watch out. Uh, he's, he's asking you, but what's your favorite part of your job? 
My favorite part of the job is diving. Uh, we have to dive every day to clean the tank, uh, feed the fishes. For example, in that big system, we have some murrays. And the murrays, they stay on the bottom, hide under the rocks, and you have to go diving to feed them. That's the best part of the job. And just, uh, I think, not sure sort of whether um, students watching have been diving, uh, not just in the tank, but you know, on the reef itself. You've been diving on the reef. What, what, what was it like the first time? What was that, that sensation like? Well, for me, it was like a dream because I'm fascinated by cold and reef. Uh, but yeah, I remember it was impressive to see how noisy it is. The reef is not quiet. You know, if you put your head in, like, in a container of water, yeah, you won't hear anything. And I thought it would be the same in the ocean. But no, in the ocean, there's life everywhere, life. Uh, you have noise all over the place, all the fishes, all the inlets on the bottom, uh, the waves, everything makes sounds and it's impressive it's, it's so interesting just just um uh, up the road a few um uh, is some great research being done um uh, by steve simpson at exeter university yeah. looking at the importance of noise on the reef uh, really really interesting exciting research on just that aspect and uh, so so many things you can study as a marine biologist and if I may say, regarding that, they have tried an experiment. They put some speaker into the water, recreating the noise of a reef. And the fishes were attracted by that noise and came, which is amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> we haven't quite got into what music they like, but maybe that's <laughs> a, a, a further, further piece of research that can be done. Um, this is from students in Brittany in France. Um, so it's, it's asking about evolution. Is then could fish one day evolve to be at the top of the food chain? So first, a shark is a fish. Considering that sharks are on top of the food chain in the oceans, we can easily say that fish are already on top of the food chain, right? Uh, but if your question concerns like all the fishes we see in the oceans, it's a good question. Uh, some of them might, but not all of them, because as Jamie explained, you need predators and you need prey. So if all the fishes become predators, it's going to be an issue. <laughs> right? But it is possible, but it's going to take thousands, thousands of years. Just to pick up and connect to yesterday's lesson where we looked at adaptation, we looked, and um, today we've been talking about lots of different species. On the coral reef, you will find that each uh, species has a particular, has adapted to find food in a particular way, um, and what we call a niche in science. Could you explain maybe a couple of adaptations to find food in a particular way that, and I'm not sure, uh, irritatingly, our, our, our fish are not behaving and they're not coming right close up um, just for this moment. But what, what, what can you see um, that has adapted to a particular feeding behaviour? Well, we have these butterfly fishes, so in the wild they do eat anemones and cobalt polyps. And so in captivity they reproduce the same behaviour. So they always have their head down looking for cobalt polyps or anemones. Unfortunately for them, we don't have coral polyps in that system, but they still act the same way. They still swim the same way, looking for food. Like and if they were looking for coral polyps. And that mouth is shaped. That's a new exactly. Way. That's the way. Yeah, they have this mouth that allow them to eat coral polyps. So in captivity, they will find some holes between rocks, and they will manage to go in the hole and try to take the food that is in the hole. Brilliant. There's, a, there's another great question here, and it relates to one of the species um, behind us. Um, and one of the examples on the other, how does the arrival of a different species affect the food chain? And I'm thinking about, I know we've got some lionfish in this tank. Yes. Um, they are a species that is um, sort of endemic in, in for the Pacific region. Yes. But 
they have been introduced somehow into the Caribbean. Yes. What impact has that had on, on the Caribbean uh, food chain? So there's a huge impact. Why? Because in the Caribbean, you don't have, I mean, these fishes don't have any predators. So they can just, the population keep increasing and there's no predator to control that population. So as you have more lionfish, then the prey get under pressure and their population starts declining as well. So we need to control this population as you said, it is not from the Caribbean. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got, I think, just time for, for three more questions. Uh, and these are uh, from Antrim and Brittany, but to go through them, the wonderful questions. Um, what is the biggest problem for animals currently, um, and, and what impact does this have on the free chain? So, so what's, what's the biggest problem for life in the ocean at the moment? It's hard to pick one. But basically, climate change and uh, overfishing, that's for sure. Yeah. So, um, just, just to, to go into that, um, we, there's a science term used in marine science, and, and it's really important for you guys to understand. We'll go into more detail tomorrow. A multiple stress environment. So, think about human impact, not just as one thing here or one thing there, but about lots of things. And it's a bit like having a bad day. If one thing goes wrong, like you put your foot through your sock, that's okay. If you then spill your cereal on your lap, that starts to get a little bit worse. If you miss the bus, then that's even worse. If you have these multiple things and it turns into something quite bad. Yeah, and they are sometimes connected, like climate change might affect one species, and then if humans overfish these species, then you have these two big threats on top of them, and that makes the situation even worse. So, so um, two last questions really, really connected is what, what happens um, if, if, one, if, if part of a, a food web goes extinct? Well, unfortunately, the old ecosystem will collapse because all these food chains are interconnected. So it is sad to say, but that's the truth. Every species in the ocean are interconnected and they all need each other, okay? If you remove one chain, everything collapses. And, and is, is that the case always, or is that the case because we're finding this extension happening much more suddenly rather than over time, in the past where a certain species um, dies out and another one comes in to fill, fill that role, that place in the food web. Yes, you, you feel right. Like, nature is impressive and can adapt, right? So if it takes thousands of years to adapt, then yes, it's possible that one piece of the food web can disappear without collapsing the full food web. But the issue is nowadays, things are going at a rate that is too fast. Things changing too fast, too quickly, and humans are a big part of that. And the nature don't have the time to adapt, it's going too fast for them. So, thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you so much to all the students who are watching. I think we've, we've, we've had, we've been talking about food chains, we've been talking about the, the amazing connectivity, the abundance, the magic of the reef. We've been talking about how human activity can, can start to have a negative impact. What we haven't done quite yet, and I want to start our final message for today, is to just the final piece, this from, from my point of view, what are the positive impacts that humans can have on the ocean and the coral reef? I mean, certainly from your side, you are having a positive impact by sharing the wonder of these environments through the aquarium. Are there other things that we can all do or we should be really proud of and promote? Right, uh, the thing is, if we want to have a positive impact, we have to stop thinking for ourselves 
then we have to consider that we humans are part of this food ecosystem. We are part of the food web. So if we act and if we respect all the other species of animals, then we will do only great things. Um, when you go swimming, just think about the sunscreen you use. And you might, by using one that is reef safe, make a big difference. You can also put a t-shirt instead of being under the sun at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, you can definitely learn more about marine biology and do like Jimmy, talk to everybody and try to make sure that people are connected to the ocean. And when they act, when they do something, they think of ocean. Brilliant. I mean, my, my final thing was if, if you live um, in more temperate um, areas, and I think a lot of our viewers do, uh, rock pooling uh, was how I got into uh, the ocean. Uh, it is definitely, uh, I don't know, I mean, in a, in a normal rock pool, an intertidal pool, the, you, you find a huge diversity of life. So you don't need to, to go diving of Curacao to find a really wonderful array of marine life. But enjoy its wonder. Think about the ways you can reduce your impact. Thank you so, so much um, to everybody. Thank you to Pierre. Um, Pierre, part of sharing the ocean through the aquarium, the, our virtual tours that the aquarium's uh, schools team is putting on. And we're going to leave you uh, with a short video introduction to those. Um, but until tomorrow, we'll be looking more at human impact on the reef. It's goodbye from Coral Line. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.